has to be Okay. Yes, recording in progress. Okay, <laughs> so, um, here is the second part of uh, Professor Ivatovich's lecture on uh, biophysics, and let's continue. Okay. Um, here. So, the second part. Um, in the second part, I will start talking more about the outcomes of uh, uh, cell division that we uh, discussed a little bit in the, in the questions uh, after the first part. So I mentioned at the beginning that uh, chromosome segregation errors can cause aneuploidy. Just to make it uh, more closer to you, this is how a segregation error looks. So this, these are the bridging microtubules of the mitotic spindle. These are the kinetochores in pink. And this is one kinetochore that is lagging behind the others. And uh, it may end, end up in a wrong cell so that uh, one cell gets uh, both parts, uh, both uh, copies of this kinetochore and the other one gets zero. So this is very bad. And then this kind of uh, aneuploid karyotypes look like this. This is a human cell. Uh, these are our chromosomes. As you know, we should have two copies of each chromosome, but this is a cell that had many errors over many generations before. So uh, it has, uh, for example, three copies of chromosome two and so on. This is what we mean by aneuploidy, when a cell has a wrong number of chromosomes. And this is, as I mentioned before, very common in, uh, in many uh, types of cancer. And it's also thought to contribute to the to the appearance of cancer in the, in the first place, but this is not very well understood. What is the interplay between uh, aneuploidy and cancer and how aneuploidy itself can lead to, uh, can or cannot uh, lead to cancer. Okay, but I will start this by asking a question. Which chromosome is this one here? Uh, is it some specific chromosome that makes mistakes more often than the others? Do some chromosomes make these mistakes more often? Um, and this is something that we worked on uh, recently. And in particular, we ask whether, whether the chromosome location with respect to the mitotic spindle will affect its fate. By fate, I mean what will happen by the end of mitosis, whether it will segregate correctly or not correctly. So the idea is that it's not the same uh, whether the chromosome, that it matters whether the chromosome is found in a certain regions of the cell behind the spindle pole, this is a spindle pole, or maybe here in the central part. This was the idea, and we wanted to test this. Um, so it's known that different chromosomes, when, when the mitosis starts, they have different rules how they uh, come to the central part of the spindle. So some chromosomes that are found uh, by accident or by some other reason, uh, in the middle here, in the region between the two centrosomes, they very quickly uh, attach to microtubules and become aligned at the metaphase plate, which we have seen in the previous talk. Then the chromosomes that are somewhere here, they also kind of reach the spindle reasonably quick, quickly, but it's not very well known what is happening with these chromosomes. These are called polar because they are behind the pole. So if you make this kind of line perpendicular to the spindle axis, then all the chromosomes that are behind this line, they are polar. And they are very interesting. Very little is known about them. They are very interesting because if the chromosome is here, it has to somehow pass this region, cir circumvent, bypass this region of the centrosome to come to this place, because this is the goal where the chromosome needs to, to go. So it's known that this kind of polar chromosome depend on certain motor proteins. In particular, uh, the motor protein called dynein is moving this chromosome towards the pole. And it's also known that when the chromosome is somewhere here, the motor protein sent E moves it towards the uh, equ equ equatorial plane, sorry. But it's not known how the chromosome switches from here to here. And especially because this is a very crowded area with lots of microtubules, how does the chromosome then come from here to here? So how to answer such a question? Well, the most direct way is to use microscopy and to observe all chromosomes and what they do. And this is what uh, we decided to do. So we took a cell in which we have, uh, it's a human cell, we labeled all kinetochores and centrosomes. 
and uh, they're labeled all of them in green, but I'm showing you here in different colors, the Z position. So the position along the Z axis or depth, meaning that the, those kinetochores uh, that are more in orange color or yellow, they are down and these more in blue and pink and red again, they are more up. So this is the Z position of the kinetochores. And we make this kind of movies. We film the cell from the beginning uh, before mitosis even begins. And now you see the spindle forms. Now the chromosomes come to the metaphase plate and eventually they segregate. And we track by software all of these kinetochores with respect to the centrosomes. Here is one centrosome, on the other side was the other centrosome. And we can then track every kinetochore and see what it did. And then we wanted to analyze our polar chromosomes. And we, de we defined three types of chromosomes in the following way. So when mitosis starts, we have the two centrosomes and then we call the chromosomes polar, th those that are behind the centrosome. Then we have the central ones, they're in the central part between the two uh, centrosome. And then we have peripheral non-polar. So they are at the periphery of the nucleus but they are not polar, they are between the two centrosomes. centrosomes. And we measured the time that each of these groups, chromosomes in each of these groups take to get uh, aligned at the metaphase plate. And we found that indeed, as we hypothesized, that the polar ones would take more time to align because they somehow, um, they somehow need to get around this centrosome. They take more time than peripheral non-polar and, and then central chromosomes. Uh, and I have to emphasize that the polar and peripheral non-polar, we took these chromosomes in such a way that they all had the same, on average, this group and the average of this group had the same distance to the metaphase plate. So it's not about the distance. It's not about that the polar ones have to uh, cover a larger distance. These guys also have to cover a large distance, but, uh, Sorry, but uh, the polar ones take more time because they are delayed in the region of the centrosome. They somehow spend more time in this region because for some reason it's hard to pass the centrosome. And this is something that is unknown and that we are also uh, currently studying. Okay, these, uh, what I have shown you uh, the movie on the previous slide, this is a healthy cell. So it doesn't make errors because it has the, checkpoint that checks that uh, all the chromosomes have to be aligned, everything has to be fine, only then it will segregate the chromosomes. So this is why on, on healthy cells, we can measure only how much time it takes the chromosome to get aligned, but we cannot measure, uh, measure any errors uh, in segregation because there are no errors. But we can do this trick. We can inhibit a protein called MPS1, which is an important protein of this checkpoint. So now we have a cell, when we treated it with this inhibitor, this cell doesn't have a properly working checkpoint. So it starts to segregate chromosomes, even though not all the chromosomes are properly attached and it makes a lot of errors. And you can see the errors here. For example, these chromosomes that are behind, when you see the two groups of chromosomes separating in the middle, some chromosomes remain and they are potential errors. And also you can see some chromosomes like for example, there is a blue one that will come here. Uh, here it is. These are two kinetochores and they will move to the same pole. They will not separate one on one side and one on the other side. So these kind of cells make a lot of errors. And now we can measure again whether it depends on our uh, polar chromosomes. So uh, we, first of all, we found that the number of, of errors correlates with the number of polar chromosomes. So the cells that had more polar chromosomes, more chromosomes behind the pole here in the beginning of mitosis, they, at the end of mitosis, made more errors. And uh, also, they, uh, when, when we looked at the error type, we found that the polar chromosomes in particular had a lot of errors, and these errors were either unaligned chromosome, this is the one that stays at the pole all the time, or the lagging one that you saw that is lagging between the two, uh, between the two regions. While the central chromosomes don't, uh, predominantly don't make any errors, meaning it's very important uh, where you are in the beginning, if you're a chromosome, where you are in the beginning of mitosis, this will determine 
uh, how many errors uh, there will be. Okay, this is just a scheme of these errors. So unaligned are here. This is the unaligned for the polar chromosomes and ligand chromosomes. So these are the errors that these chromosomes uh, make. Then we turn to cancer cells to see how this is in cancer cells. And this is an osteosarcoma cell, which often has these polar chromosomes. And we made this kind of analysis. We again uh, made movies of these cells and followed uh, these kinetochores, especially the ones that stay at the pole. And we asked how many unaligned chromosomes come from the polar region. This is depicted here. So when you have cells in metaphase and the majority of the chromosomes are here, sometimes we have an unaligned chromosome, this guy here, and we are asking how many of them come from the polar region behind the pole and how many come from other regions. What we expect is 22 or so percent. If everything was random, then there will be 22 percent because this is the, uh, this is the fraction of uh, uh, chromosomes uh, uh, from the polar region. And this is what we saw in the experiment. So much more than expected from a random case, we see more than 60% of these unaligned chromosomes come from the polar region. So the polar region is really a problematic uh, region. Um, these chromosomes typically end up uh, unaligned here. And now let's see what happens with them, with these unaligned chromosomes in anaphase. So we looked at errors in anaphase. Anaphase is the phase when the chromosomes are separating. And I'm showing you here three kinds of errors. One is unaligned. That is the chromosome that stays completely unaligned. It never went to the equatorial plane. It stays here and both parts of the chromosome are uh, uh, retained in one cell, one daughter cell, and nothing is on the other side. Then we have the lagging chromosome. This is one lagging chromosome, which can then end up either here or there. And then we have a so-called chromosome bridge. This is a bridge of DNA. So this kind of error, this is an error because this DNA will break in the end. So you will have a broken DNA, but this is an error that is not related to microtubules and the spindle, but it's more related to the improperly replicated DNA uh, and these kind of processes. And we ask how many of these errors are preceded by an unaligned chromosome in metaphase? What we expect from a random uh, uh, behavior, meaning that if unaligned chromosomes do not influence the errors, is something like 40%. And these are the results. Now, for unaligned, we have 100% because by definition, these are the chromosomes that are unaligned in anaphase, and they are preceded by being unaligned in metaphase. So this is no surprise. This is just the definition of the unaligned chromosome. Now let's look at the chromosome bridge. Chromosome bridge is very close. The measured value is very close, not uh, statistically different from the expected from a random uh, case. And this is because the chromatin bridge is not related to microtubules and alignment and, and, and so on. It's just a matter of, uh, of uh, unreplicated DNA. So, so we expect this one to not be related to unaligned uh, chromosomes. And then the interesting part is this one, the lagging chromosome. These thing, these guys here that lag behind the others, they are often, much more often than expected, they are preceded by an unaligned chromosome uh, in metaphase. So, so somehow this unaligned chromosome in metaphase uh, ends up with one part lagging and one part properly uh, segregating. So the, altogether, this means that the chromosome location behind the pole makes the chromosome delay their congression. Congression is when they move to the metaphase plate. And this contributes to the high frequency of segregation errors of these polar chromosomes. So the chromosome location determines this fate. This is just a conclusion. And we call this a danger zone. So behind the pole, there is this danger zone. If a chromosome is here, it will have a more chance to uh, missegregate, meaning make an error in segregation than the chromosome in this, uh, in this region. And this is very important because different, uh, biologically and medically, it's very important because different cancers have different, uh, uh, very specific chromosomes uh, multiplied 
or sometimes uh, not two copies, but only one copy of a chromosome. So for example, it's typically, typically in several types of cancer, chromosome seven, for example, is uh, present in more copies. And this can be related to the position of the chromosomes be before the spindle forms, because chromosomes have their territories in, in the nucleus before the division. And uh, this may then affect the, their, uh, the, the position where they're located before mitosis, it affects whether they will make an error or not. This is what we have shown. And this may affect during cancer development, how certain cancers will end up with certain uh, surplus of certain chromosomes and, and not some other chromosomes. Okay, but now let's go back to biophysics. How does this polar chromosome here bypass the centrosome and get to here. We, we saw now that this, there is something uh, problematic happening here. It has to somehow uh, move across this centrosome region to come to the center of bias. So how is this happening? Well, again, when we ask some question, how is something happening in the cell? The best thing is to do microscopy to just see what is happening there. And now I have to explain what we are seeing here. It's a fireworks, but the fireworks is the big white spot is the centrosome or the spindle pole. The small white spots that are shooting out of the centrosomes are protein EB3, and protein EB3 marks the tips of the growing microtubules. So each of these spots is one growing microtubule. So you are seeing how microtubules grow from the centrosome. And the blue guys are the kinetochores on the chromosome. Okay, so this is our pole. This is a polar chromosome because it's behind the pole, these two kinetochores here, and we see microtubules shooting. Uh, what is very interesting in this movie, I will show you on the next slide because maybe it's hard to see in this fireworks movie. So if we took, if we take single frames for this, from this movie, actually we take several frames and we superimpose them on each other, but that's not so important now. What is important is we can get a trace of individual microtubules, these gray lines. And now look at this. Here's the centrosome. Here are our kinetochores. This microtubule is here. 30 seconds later, it's here. Some more seconds later, it's here. If we superimpose these positions of a microtubule, we get the first one, second one, and the third one. And the centrosome is here. Do you see what this microtubule is doing? It's making a so-called pivoting motion. It's rotating around the centrosome. It looks like the centrosome is some kind of pivot point or a hinge, and the microtubule is moving like this. Now, how is this possible? What is this pivoting movement? Well, we have seen pivoting before. My lab has found pivoting in yeast. Uh, what I have shown you before was human cells. Now we go to yeast, in particular fission. Yeast doesn't matter, it's some kind of yeast. Yeast is great because yeast cells are very small and they have very few microtubules. So human cell has several thousand new measurements show that the spindle in a human cell has 6,000 microtubules. This guy has altogether 20 microtubules. So it's great to work on yeast because you can see each individual microtubule. And what we did some time ago, it's almost 10 years ago, is that we saw uh, these microtubules in yeast, and we discovered that they can pivot. And you can see this here. This is the in green microtubules. You can see the mitotic spindle of the yeast. It's this line, this bundle here. And then look at these guys going up here and here. You see that they are changing their angle. This microtubule here is changing its angle with respect to the spindle. So it's doing this. And what we found is that this kind of motion helps the microtubule to capture the kinetochore, to find the chromosome in the kinetochore because it's kind of swiping through space. Also later, we found that this motion is important to make the spindle in yeast. In yeast, this is one spindle pole, this is the other. And I hope in this movie, you can appreciate this kind of movement. The microtubules start like this and they go like this and they make a spindle. Uh, later, another lab has uh, identified the molecules that are uh, allowing for this pivoting. So you can see this molecule here is important uh, to be flexible enough uh, to, to make this pivoting. And if you make it shorter, then uh, the pivoting will not happen again because this will be uh, too stiff. This link will be too short and too stiff. So 
again comes our Nenad Pavin, our great collaborator with whom we are making so many models. This was one of uh, uh, our early models. And uh, in, in this case, we said, we see this pivoting and we ask, can this pivoting help really the microtubules to capture the kinetochores? How fast uh, is this capture process? And we can make, uh, or Nenad can make a very simple model. So in our model, we have the spindle pole body, the spindle pole, here is a microtubule. This is a model for yeast. Here's the nucleus. And here's the kinetochore on the chromosome, which needs to be captured. The microtubule is performing angular diffusion. So it's moving like this in a purely diffusive manner. The kinetochore itself is also diffusing. And we are just asking how, uh, how long will it take for the microtubule and kinetochore to meet. So it's just one kind of a first passage uh, uh, problem. And this is what the model predicts. So if we, uh, if we solve this model and calculate the fraction of lost kinetochores, these, these are the ones that are not yet captured by microtubule, over time, it goes like this. With the parameters from the measured cell, we start with 100% with all kinetochores being lost. And over time, they're being captured. And after, let's say, 10 minutes, we have still 30% uh, uh, still lost kinetochores. This is a direct prediction of the model. There is no fitting parameters because we have measured the diffusion of the microtubule of the kinetochore, the size of the microtubule, the size of the kinetochore. So we have all the parameters that we need for the model. We measure them in our experiment. So this is a direct prediction from the model. And then we measured in experiments how our kinetochores are being captured, how fast, and these are the experimental data. And they fit very nicely. Uh, with the model, there is some discrepan discrepancy at later times, but at later times, biologically, many things happen, the spindle grows and so on. But overall, this is a really nice uh, um, uh, agreement with the direct prediction of the model. And what it means, if we include pivoting in this system, so our model is based on pivoting, the typical time to capture about half of the kinetochores is about three minutes. And the old model, the prevailing model in the field, which does not include pivoting, it, it is called search and capture model, which just includes growth and shrinkage of the microtubules, it would take for the same parameters about 100 minutes. So this shows you how pivoting, this pivoting motion of the microtubules can increase 30 times, can, can accelerate the, 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 the capture, the process of the capture that microtubules need to capture the chromosomes. Pivoting is a very efficient uh, way for the microtubules to, uh, to capture something. So this was our work on the kinetochore capture. Then later we extended this model on spindle assembly and you see a simulation based on the same idea. So microtubules start and they just diffuse, they perform angular diffusion. When they meet, motor proteins bind and motor proteins move towards the pole, this pole and this pole. And this is why the motor proteins make the microtubules align into a spindle. And this is how, uh, this is what we propose, how the spindle uh, assembles in yeast. And microtubule pivoting, so this motion is very important here. Okay, this was yeast, but not, what about human cells? Nobody has studied this yet in human cells, but there are some indications that pivoting may happen. Uh, for example, there are beautiful experiments with the micro needle where uh, another lab put a micro needle here in the spindle and they pull like this. And after the pull, you get a structure like this. So you see that the angle of the microtubule with respect to the spindle axis changed. It increased by this pull, meaning microtubule can pivot if you pull it uh, around the spindle pole. It will not get, sorry, it will not get pulled out, but it will, but rather it will pivot. Also, our experiments on spindle compression, if you just take the spindle and compress it from above, uh, the, the angle of the microtubule increases. This angle here increases compared to here. And the same if you treat the, if you put the cells on cold, then many microtubules disassemble and uh, the remaining spindle has a much higher angle of these microtubules at the pole. So this all means if you perturb the spindle in different ways, microtubules can pivot around the pole. And we thought that this pivoting is the crucial process that brings the chromosome uh, from here to here. 
Now, how does this happen? Um, is it really happening? What is driving this process? So we quantified it by quantifying the angle that the kinetochores make with the spindle axis. And we see that over time, this angle goes down. It starts with about 120 degrees, like on this drawing, and goes down to about 50. This is when the, this is when the kinetochores uh, sit on the spindle. At the same time, spindle length is increasing. So this is important. The increase in length could drive this uh, pivoting motion. But we first needed to test the, the motor proteins that I have mentioned before. There are two motor proteins, uh, SEMP-E and dynane, which is working together with this spindly, which are known uh, uh, to be involved in the process of alignment of polar chromosomes. And when we depleted each of them, we didn't see any difference in the angle change. So the angle change roughly uh, followed the same pattern in these depletions, so the blue and, and green curves, as in the white one for untreated cells, and also the spindle length also more or less uh, increased in the same manner. So these proteins are important for many different things, but not for this uh, spindle length increase and the angle decrease. So we thought that maybe it's the elongation of the spindle itself driving the pivoting motion. This hypothesis predicts that the reversal of spindle elongation, so if we would make the spindle collapse instead of elongate, this should reverse the pivoting. And to test this, we, we use the inhibitor of the egg 5 uh, motor, which induces spindle shortening. And what we saw in this case, that while in untreated cells, the angle goes down, indeed, in these cells, the angle goes up. And in them, the spindle length goes down, shortens, and here the spindle elongates. And finally, we had a perturbation in which we can induce, <coughs> sorry, a rigor binding of this motor. Rigor binding means the motor just binds and there is no elongation and no shortening of the spindle because the motor binds uh, too firmly and cannot detach. And in this case, the angle doesn't change and the spindle length doesn't change. So we propose it's the spindle length. If the spindle elongates, the pivoting will go towards the inside. And if the spindle shortens, the pivoting uh, is directed towards the outside. And now we made a very simple model in which we assume that the resistance to pivoting around the spindle pole is very small. And the resistance to chromosome motion is very large. So chromosome basically stays, uh, doesn't move much in the viscous cytoplasm because it's big. And then we can calculate for a certain spindle length change, how much would the angle change? This is a very simple geometrical uh, calculation. And these are our different treatments and untreated cells. They all lie close to this uh, curve. And also you can see here when the spindle length decreases, the angle is increasing. And when the spindle length increases, then the angle goes down. So we are very happy with this uh, thing. And we uh, conclude from here that it's the spindle elongation that makes the chromosome move from the back side to the front side of the spindle. It's basically the chromosome moves not so much and the centrosome moves the most. And this just puts the chromosome then in the vicinity uh, of, the, of the spindle body uh, microtubules. OK, now the chromosome is here. How does it get to the midplane? We have seen in the first part of my talk how the chromosomes need to be here at the midplane, but how do they get from here to here? This is a centering problem. This is a problem of how something becomes centered between the two centrosomes or something else. And many people have worked on this for many years including a lot of physicists. So a lot of uh, theoretical models have been made and this is a very, very interesting uh, area. So I will tell you briefly about the main ideas in this field. So first you can get the centering of a chromosome by length dependent pushing forces for three reasons. First of all, if you think of a centrosome, then if a chromosome is close, to the centrosome, there will be more microtubules interacting with it and growing microtubules can push. So this chromosome, there will be many microtubules pushing it away from the centrosome than this one. So if you have two centrosomes, then in the middle, 
uh, the, this centrosome will push it away from itself, the other centrosome from itself, so they will be uh, in the middle. And microtubule density uh, follows approximately uh, this kind of relationship with the distance, uh, decreases with the distance squared from the centrosome. Then, the microtubules are not all of the equal length because, as you remember from the first part, the microtubules grow and shrink. And if you have growing and shrinking microtubules uh, and randomly switching between growth and shrinkage, you get an exponential distribution of the microtubule length. So the microtubule number and the distance from the center somewhere microtubule length have exponential uh, an exponential uh, relationship, meaning that there are many, many small ones pushing a lot from the centrosome if the chromosome is closed and very few long ones that are pushing just uh, a little bit. And finally also, there is, a, there is a dependence of the force on the length. So the critical Euler uh, force for buckling is smaller for a long microtubule than for a short one. So the short microtubule will be able to push the chromosome away from the centrosome more than the small one. So when you put all these three things together, you, you can get a, a nice centering mechanism that can uh, center the chromosomes between two centrosomes. But this is not the whole story. There is a length dependent uh, microtubule dynamics and then also uh, consequently the pulling force, which I will explain now. So it's known that there are certain motors, for example, some of them are called tenesinate. They can move or they can bind everywhere along the microtubule and they move processively, meaning they move all the way to the end of the microtubule. And this is why a long microtubule will accumulate more motors near the kinetochore than a short one. And these, micro, these motors uh, have been shown to do different things. They can either um, uh, increase the depolymerization rate so that the long microtubule, because it accumulates more motors, will depolymerize faster, which will then make a stronger pulling force on this chromosome in the direction to the right than to the left. Or they can undergo catastrophe frequency more often, so they can switch from growing to shrinking more often, which will again move the chromosome from here towards the center or they can pause, uh, which is similar to uh, switching to shrinkage. In any case, overall, these motors suppress the growth of a long microtubule. So this means that the long microtubule will stop growing and the short one will not stop growing. So the chromosome will move towards the middle. <coughs> so this is known to work very well in the cells. And then, we thought that there could be another um, uh, player here. And this is our bridging, because of our bridging microtubule that we discovered, we thought that because this bridging microtubule is passing close to the kinetochore microtubules, it can exert force on kinetochore microtubules. And this way we would get length dependent pull pulling forces, not just at the microtubule end, but along the length of the microtubule. So the longer one will have more motors, the longer microtubules will accumulate more motors. And this is why this side will pull uh, with a stronger force to the right than the short one to the left. Uh, this would be the length dependent pulling forces exerted along the length of the kinetochore fiber. And this is something that we proposed that was not, uh, this was not existing in the, in the models uh, before we proposed this recently. This is still very controversial and exciting in the field. And um, I, I'm just reminding you why we proposed this. This is because we found this bridging fiber here between the kinetochore fibers. So there is this microtubule going all along the length of the kinetochore fibers and can probably accumulate motors there and generate some force, which we will see later. But there is yet another thing that I have to tell you that I haven't told you so far, which also needs to be taken account. And this is a very uh, cool uh, thing in the spindle and it's called forward flux. So the spindle is constantly undergoing flux towards the pole. You can see this here. Here we have labeled with this, uh, with this blue spot, we have labeled a certain part. Uh, we have photoactivated with the laser. It's like putting a mark on the spindle. 
and you see that this mark is moving towards the pole. So the spindle is all the time, the microtubules are undergoing flux towards the pole. They are disassembling here and assembling here. And if we want to understand how the chromosomes get centered here, we have to take into account this kind of thing. And this kind of thing has been known for a long time, since 89, but nobody has considered it in the models for chromosome centering until now. And we thought that we have to include these uh, important things, the polar flux and the bridging fiber to understand the chromosome centering. And this is our model, again, by our Leonard Pavin, uh, Pavin and his uh, group. And I will show you now the animation made on this model. And if you understand this animation, then you will understand uh, everything about this part. So our hypothesis is that microtubule flux drives chromosome alignment. Let me show you the animation. So first, let me tell you uh, what is, this is our model, very simple. Here are the kinetochores and the chromosome is this elastic spring. Then we have the uh, red and blue are microtubules. The red ones are kinetochore microtubules and the blue ones are bridging microtubules. You see that all of them move towards the edges. This is the polar flux. This is the flux that they are undergoing. In our model, the flux is driven by the motor proteins. Motor proteins are these white guys that are walking. And you see that these white guys are pushing every pair of antiparallel microtubules apart. Antiparallel means that you can see these arrows. When the arrows are pointing in different directions, then it's antiparallel. So they can move blue versus blue, or this red versus this blue, or this red versus this blue. Anytime the microtubules, these motors have the property that they find antiparallel microtubules and slide them apart. This is how we think the flux is generated. And this, this is all we have in the model. And this model automatically puts the chromosome in the center. Why? Because the flux of the longer K fiber is faster in the model than the flux of the short K fiber. And if you have faster flux of the long one, it will move the chromosome in the direction of the long one, meaning to the center. And why is the flux of the longer faster? It's because the overlap of the longer is lo longer, this overlap with the bridging microtubules is longer on the side of the longer kinetical fiber. So this overlap is longer than this overlap, okay? So this is why this model centers the chromosome. And we think that this is an important factor uh, that this kind of effect is important in the spindle. This is completely new. Uh, no one has proposed the role of bridging microtubules or of uh, flux in this, in this uh, uh, particular case to, uh, to center the chromosome. So let's see whether our model is true. It seems very logical. Once uh, Nenad Pavin and his group uh, proposed this, it seemed very logical, but nobody has measured this before that that the flux of one kinetochore fiber would be faster than the other one. Uh, we always, uh, in, in this spindle field, we always measure flux of one number per spindle. Every microtubule is fluxing at the same rate. But this model predicts that the bridging microtubules are faster than kinetochore microtubules, and the long red one is faster than the short red one. So let's see whether this is the case. Now, to do this, we needed, we experimentalists, needed to do to develop a new method <coughs> to be able to see individual microtubules. And we did this by very small concentration of this sertubulin dye that, that I discussed before. And you can see these white spots. So first, let me tell you, blue spots are kinetochores. And the white spots are spots on individual microtubules. So th they are so uh, rare, uh, so... Um, a sparse in space that each spot is a spot on an individual microtubule and we can follow it. And we can follow it in this way. If we find the white spot passing by the kinetochores, we say this is a spot in the bridging fiber. And if we find the spot appearing near the kinetochore, we say this is a spot in the kinetochore fiber. And now we can measure everything. Let's rem remind ourselves what is the unique prediction of our model. It is that the longer kinetochore fiber, the dark red one, has a faster flux than the short one. And we can just measure this now. So we measure the kinetochore fiber length and the kinetochore fiber flux velocity. And we indeed found the correlation 
that the longer kinetochore fibers flux at the faster rate than the shorter one. So this is this is really cool. Nobody has measured something like this before, and uh, uh, people still don't believe us, let's say, because it's very new. And uh, anyway, this shows you uh, that this difference exists. And if a long one flux is faster than the short one, this automatically has a centering effect because it will move the chromosome in the direction of the long one, which is towards the center. So this is the core of our centering mechanism. OK, let's see some other predictions of, the, of this. The second prediction of this model is that the bridging fiber flux is faster than kinetochore fibers, no matter long short. And we measured this. The bridging fiber indeed covers a larger distance over time than kinetochore microtubules. And then what we did is uh, we also made some theoretical predictions for uh, when we change different parameters in the model. Um, it's not so important what these parameters are now, but let's say this, I can tell you, this is the parameter describing the velocity or uh, the maximum velocity of the bridging fiber sliding. And this parameter is the parameter that determines the forces uh, at the kinetochores and how fast uh, the microtubule will poly polymerize here. In any case, here we we changed this parameter and we got this kind of curve to describe how the kinetochore fiber flux uh, depends on the bridging fiber flux, and this is the other curve. In all cases, always the bridging fiber flux is faster than the kinetochore fiber, so we are always in this triangle here. And now we experimentalists made a lot of experiments we treated the cells with different uh, with, uh, with different uh, uh, treatments in which we deplete certain proteins. So each of these uh, uh, colored dots is depletion of one protein, and we performed experiments on many cells for each color dot, and we get this kind of thing. So uh, in all our treatments, we are in the lower uh, triangle, so the bridging fiber is faster than the, than the kinetochore fiber, and we also have data points that lie on the blue curve and data points that lie, on, that lie on the orange curve, which means that probably in these treatments, we mainly changed this parameter, whereas in these treatments, we mainly changed uh, this parameter. And untreated cells are here in white. And then the final prediction is that uh, the ratio of the K-fiber flux and the bridging fiber flux is the most important determinant of how well the chromosome will be centered. So mm -hmm. here we plot the distance from the equator versus this ratio, and this is a theoretical curve. And when we plot our uh, treatments uh, that we did experimentally, we see that these treatments lie very nicely on this curve uh, with untreated cells here in white. So this means that when we have a smaller K-fiber to bridging fiber flux ratio, for example, here, we have better alignment of chromosome because the distance is smaller. This is because in this case, the kinetochore fiber is allowed to slide with respect to the bridging fiber. And when we have this ratio close to one, so they are moving together, they're not sliding with respect to each other, then there is worse alignment because kinetochore fiber cannot slide with respect to the bridging fiber and cannot center the chromosome. So overall, I have shown you now that there is a new type of centering mechanism which is uh, where length, uh, based on length dependent pooling forces. And just a summary to understand how this works, uh, which is just a different representation of what I have shown you before. So if you imagine a chromosome being misaligned, not in the center, and if you imagine making marks here, 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 and here, after some time, the bridging microtubules, these guys down here, will slide apart. So this mark will move here, and this mark will move by an equal distance here. Now, this one has a longer overlap with the bridging microtubules, so this one will move less than this one because, uh, because the, the elastic spring here is, uh, is preventing the sliding of this one to be equal to this one, so it has to be slower. So this mark is going to move until here. And now, most importantly, the mark on the short microtubule, because it has a very short overlap with the, with the uh, bridging microtubule, will move only a little bit. So this one will move a lot until here, and this one will move a little bit until here. And this is the reason why the chromosome will move towards the center. So this is this new concept alignment by length dependent pooling forces. And I am at the summary. 
so I have shown you that it's bad to be in this danger zone behind the centrosome. And if you are here, then you have, if you're a chromosome, then you have a higher chance to missegregate at the end of cell division. How these chromosomes are rescued from here to get to here, it's by microtubule pivoting, which itself is driven by spindle elongation. And finally, once they are here, uh, one important mechanism that puts them in the center is this length dependent flux of kinetochore fibers, where longer one flux is faster and brings the chromosome to the cell center. And at the very end, I want to acknowledge now uh, a subset of my PhD students and postdocs that uh, contributed to this part of the talk. I'm really lucky to have a wonderful lab. We have a great atmosphere in the lab and uh, we have a lots of fun, lots of hard times also, as always when you are a PhD student or a postdoc or a PI, uh, but uh, mostly we are really enjoying what we are doing. And it's also important to have great collaborators uh, we are collaborating with, with experimentalists. This is for the first part of this talk. And again, our Nenad Pavin and, uh, and uh, guys from his group uh, with whom we are developing models. And I think, ah, I just have a, um, a, this slide about the, the, the conference that we are organizing. It's called the mitotic spindle from living and synthetic systems to theory. So there will be a lot of uh, work uh, like I have shown you today from many different labs, uh, the, the uh, most important labs uh, in the field, including our labs. And this will be in Dubrovnik uh, in Croatia in April next year. So um, yeah, follow us uh, and uh, 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 come to this meeting, apply to this meeting. I'm not sure that we will have an online option, but um, if you can come to Dubrovnik, uh, it will be great. And thanks for listening to the second part. I'll stop the share now. No, no, I could have just, okay. I'll take questions now. I guess I will share again if I need some slides, but. Uh... I would like first to thank Eva for this. And uh, of course you can come to Dubrovnik in April. Uh, what is the deadline for application for the conference? Uh, maybe one month before. Uh, we are very generous with deadlines. I think it's going to be okay. two, two months. Uh, so some somehow in Feb. Uh, sorry, in I mean, February, January, February. In February will be the deadline for abstracts to be selected for a talk, and okay. in in March or so will be the deadline for uh, for. Um, uh, uh, registration. You can follow us, me or Nenad on Twitter. We will be tweeting about this and and okay, also uh, there will be, um, let me just uh, share my screen again so that I can uh, show this thing again. Uh, there is a website for this, which is yeah not <laughs> written here, but if you Google my Totex Spindle Dubrovnik Croatia 2023, it will come up. There is a website okay, already great. and uh, yeah. So do, do we have any questions regarding the second part of uh, Professor Tolis' talk? Online in chat. There is one. Question, okay, I can read it. Is it possible to regard chromosome attached on fiber as a sliding bead without friction? Sliding bead without friction. I, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we, are, we are thinking a lot about this friction and uh, um, I think uh, without friction, it couldn't be because it's actually, um, so for this last part of my talk, the chromosome is attached uh, like this to the fiber and there is actually a really high friction here. So the friction is important. And this is the, the, the parameter that was in orange on some graph was exactly about this friction. So um, I think without friction, uh, it wouldn't work, but it's a, it's a very uh, interesting point that, that can be, uh, that we can explore um, in the model, what would happen exactly with, without friction or at least with very small friction. 
but experimentally we know from in vitro experiments, meaning when people put a chromosome and the fiber without a cell, just on a glass slide in a in a uh, in a some watery like uh, environment, and then then it was visible uh, that there is a high friction there. So friction is definitely there, but. Uh, the model is here powerful because it can explore the role of the friction when you have a higher, very low friction. Thanks for the question. Okay, uh, since everybody are here are tired, they are here from more than ten hours, I guess. <laughs> yes. I'm they're tired. Right. They are not at Eva, so I... No, no, they are not tired of Eva, of course. <laughs> so if you have if you have any questions, uh, you may uh, send email to Eva and ask and contact her. Uh, and I guess if you have uh, any idea of collaboration or together work uh, with her lab, you can also send her the proposals and and yeah that will be also okay absolutely uh, yeah please uh, feel free to write me an email and uh, i will try to answer the best i can this is also valid for those who are online so yes let's thank speaker again okay Aka, would you like to close the today's session school and yeah, yeah. Please. Please say hi to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, okay, we have to start recording in just a second. Uh, and, uh, thank you all. I just want to thank you for the invitation and for the great discussion that was especially between the two talks.